Diving into the round two of rookie drafts by ADP, we're going to talk some late round one players that maybe are in that same tier. And we're going to, Sean, I think we're going to potentially make a selection uh, and confirm it while we're doing this recording. We are recording this one on Monday as the drafts continue, but we do have an offer on the board at the moment as we are making the selection to move back from the 202 for the 312 and a 2025 first round picks we'll talk through that and much more on today's show uh i kind of think you know uh, people ask a lot of questions sean but i think talking through the the strategy and the ideas on these sort of shows and you know we get so much positive feedback on the the draft shows and the live drafts and you and ben last week for state of bananas on three different live drafts which were absolutely phenomenal you know different strategies in each one and building you know very powerful rosters. so i think people love hearing know the thoughts in that process as you go through an entire round rather than just this player's good this player's good this player's good giving some of the the different nuance to it so looking forward to going through this today round two sean for anyone who didn't hear we did do round one on the monday podcast we talked about our selection at the 108 of xavier worthy the 107 was the pick we had we moved back for a slight uh you know kind of pick swap for future picks you mentioned something sean on the the last show about you know picking worthy on this roster with me because it was a team that we took over last year we didn't have the opportunity in that situation to probably trade for one of our favorite wide receiver or pick one of our favorite wide receivers last year which was rishi rice now rice obviously going through some legal troubles we'll see how that all plays out over the course of the off season and you know what that means for his participation in an early 2024 in the nfl but in leagues that you may have already drafted rice let's say last year in in 2023 are you adding worthy to those rosters or are you looking to you know move in different directions on on just specific rosters with with those two chiefs wide receivers specifically for dynasty i do kind of like to have them separated in terms of if i'm going to really make worthy a priority he's going to be a little bit more of a priority in leagues where I don't have rice. Now, can they work together? I think that they can. Monty and I moved in for the 111 when he fell to the 111 in our league. Even though Bo Nix is there and we desperately needed to QB and we have Rasheed Rice. I mean, that's how high evaluation we have on Worthy. I think he's somebody you should be attacking everywhere. And Again, then back to Worthy. We didn't talk about this on the, the last show either, but looking at these first rounds, Sean, you, you have heart Worthy ranked high and you've been high on him how much uh, have you been able to you know get him on your rosters over these these rookie drafts yeah it's been fun to pull him in in quite a few of these (laughs) and so that part is working out nicely i I don't think that you necessarily want to force it if you're also playing best ball because you're going to have an opportunity to make that portion of it work out if you're going to be playing a decent number of the 350 level ffpc redraft leagues again you want to look at the situations not just for your dynasty portfolio like what format is the player the best play and if there are situations where there are some differences there it can allow you to react it can, it can allow you to do that too it can allow you to relax and not overpay for someone so we want to be aware of that one of the things that i think was just so interesting as we looked at how round one developed is that there was this clear tier where generally bowers is going at the 105 not every single time and then after that spot we have a five player tier that includes two receivers and for me the three quarterbacks and the fun part of that is that we did get some jostling in individual leagues where mostly i think drake may is the clear six but we did see him occasionally going behind J.J. McCarthy. The other fun part of that is that we're occasionally seeing Adunze go very, very high. Now, for me, Worthy is such an elite prospect, and quarterbacks always have such a wide range of outcomes, and May goes to such a bad landing spot that the three QBs come after him. But I do have them in order then, and that includes Bo Nix, and then you have a Dunze at the back end of that. Now, the biggest disagreement between my rankings and the actual reality of how drafts are transpiring is that most drafters really like a Dunze and think that Nix has a low enough ceiling 
that they're not willing to pull the trigger there. And that kind of leads into this next conversation that you and I have to have is that we're on, on the clock at the 202, and that's where Nix is generally going. And so the ADP tiers, after we have the two QBs, McCarthy and May, to go along with Worthy and Nuzay, then we have this group that is Jonathan Brooks, Brian Thomas, Trey Benson, and then there's arguably a, a mini tier break. And then we have Keon Coleman, Lad McConkey, and Bo Nix in some order. Now, obviously, I would put Nix to the top of that part, but it is interesting to have the two running backs there. Brooks is mostly going ahead, but Benson, for some of the reasons that Danny Kelly outlined on OT last week, is someone that a lot of managers like. He has that immediate potential opportunity in Arizona. You have to balance the running back value versus the interesting landing spots. Now, for me, Thomas probably separates out Pat and I in our league. We had the 112, and we're trying to decide between Brooks and Thomas. And I think that's kind of the interesting discussion there because they belong in a little bit of a, a group by themselves. And then you have the Benson, McConkey, Coleman, and throw Nixon in wherever you want. So um, looking at that as the beginning of round two, how are you ordering those players and what are your thoughts on Nick's here now that we have the option, but we also have this offer, which is the 312 and a 2025 first. Yeah. So again, I guess to, to pair it all together, when we eventually, you know, we, we did, we did use up a lot of that clock trying to get different trades potentially done. We mentioned we passed on the one with Arn Rogers and the future first to select worthy there. Part of that was that, you know, I felt pretty confident that in all likelihood Nix would get to us at the, the 202. Now, as we said on the clock, that has occurred. There was every chance in between that that wouldn't occur. That is also kind of, as we talked about, Sean, playing to the picks and the owners that were in between us. So the person who has the 109, they also had the 201, and they did take J.J. McCarthy. So... They had also had the 101. They had taken Caleb Williams. So with the way the quarterback room was set up, and you touched on it on our last show, you know, trying to roster five or six quarterbacks in this format can be quite a challenge to the, the rest of your roster. So it was unlikely that they go again for quarterback. And then the team picking at the 110 were picking at the 112 also. And they were kind of set up with pretty strong situation at quarterback because they had the 104 and had taken Jalen Daniels to go with the quarterbacks that they already had. So and it looked pretty optimistic in this that we would be able to see that, you know, next quarterback that will be selected make it back to us at the the 202 there. I, I did touch on this a little bit towards the end of the show on Monday, but you know, Jonathan Brooks, Brian Thomas, Lad McConkey, Trey Benson, they were the picks that went then outside of JJ McCarthy after our selection. They all feel like you could you know across these drafts they are tossed up on in different orders in any order benson going at the 201 and ours is the highest out of any of the drafts that you have drafted in sean but most of the time going at the the 202 or the 203 and these formats you mentioned keon coleman he's kind of going in that similar zone at the start of the second round and then lad mcconkey sometimes at the the 112 but quite often in the the early second but they all feel like and that tier paired together some people are probably going to you know need a running back they go for for brooks or benson but as we record this rashid penny has signed with the panthers also uh as of monday the 6th of may but i guess sean i i <laughs> we love penny but not nothing really happened last year with him and the eagles but we'll see but i, I do think the benson lantern spot even with james connor in front of him is is more intriguing to me than the the brooks landing spot in carolina but i think that group you know with what we did and taking worthy i think he's substantially ahead of those other names and then i don't think that the drop off from the other quarterbacks to nicks is anywhere near as substantial in terms of the the worthy to those other guys here so as we play this out and as it played out i'm i'm, I'm very pleased with with how it goes and those names is there anyone for you that's really standing out the the one difficult part for us would be if if nicks had a gone in that range we're sitting now looking at let's say thomas mcconkey or benson as our potential selection whoever would have, have fell to us i think that's when we get into a 
a much more trickier conversation. Yeah, and I think that this trade-in is for Keon Coleman, not for Knicks. And so that part is interesting. I have the, the 202 and the 203 actually in quite a few drafts, and I love having those picks because the presence there of McConkey and Coleman. Now, McConkey is actually going – you know, 112 or 201 yeah, in the yeah, yeah. leagues. And so he's not necessarily going to be there every time. But the presence of guys in the early two that you can trade out for a future first, I really like that element of it. And it's one of the things oh, where... I, and I, I would agree with you. There. I think if it was a case that, you know, you mentioned we were set at quarterback and we took Aaron Rodgers with that previous trade, I think moving out here, if, if Knicks wasn't the target for us and getting that future first would be pretty much a no-brainer you know, yeah. the offer, I mean, if the next offer isn't there we're going to definitely move out yeah. and let the other manager take key uncle so the fun part of this next part is if we think that that is the question or that is the player that they'll be looking to to move up to get in this particular league that we are in uh, i mentioned some of the scenarios of like you know, thinking that the quarterback would make it through to us. Well, the 203 and the 204 are the same drafter that, that drafted at the 110 and the, the 112 that we were kind of confident that would pass on quarterback. So then, Sean, we're in a situation where we, we could potentially luck here to maneuver out of this spot at the 202, but we aren't picking again to the 307, which is 17 picks, but we do have the 402, the 407, and the... 408 along with 2025 picks as well including the ones that we did pick up previously you know what would be your thoughts on potentially moving back here from the the 402 or the 202 sorry and then maybe trying to work our way back up into you know this the second round again the working your way back up is always very difficult i don't know that we have the right personnel to accomplish that it's one of the reasons why you've got to at some point kind of get that machine going right it's not a perpetual money machine <laughs> it's a perpetual <laughs> picks machine and in order to do it you have to have picks and that was something that we talked a lot about on the previous show and discussed how to accomplish come on i, I mean i'm kind of in favor of trading this pick even though nix is somebody i have ranked as a clear first round value i think that People are going to be surprised at how many fantasy points he scored. I don't think that much credence is being given to the fact that in 2022, he rushed for 500 yards and 14 touchdowns, All right? So, I mean, this is a guy who is going to add more value with his legs than people realize. And you go back and you look like the best season for Joe Burrow, there was sneaky rushing value tacked on. The best season for Justin Herbert, there was sneaky rushing value tacked on. I think Nick's is potentially able to do that a little bit more consistently but even then when you're thinking about how a player would help you win individual years you want to be aware of that upside so next to somebody that i want to make an argument for and at the same time if we don't absolutely have to have him then maybe he's a guy we can actually pick back up in a trade from someone else later he's obviously being valued in the early second which is an easier thing to acquire than someone who's being i would argue properly valued at the 108 right those are going to be different prices so we get back in and get him there the other interesting thing is that this is a very clear tier break because after say the 203 then we have less clarity about who the player should be and one of the things i think is interesting column is that michael Penix is actually going in that next group so we have a player who is not going to play for two years right and probably isn't going to play for three years and once he does play has a good chance of busting and not because there are problems with his profile even though there are but just because qb is difficult right and i do think that you raise the the floor a little bit when you let the guy sit for multiple seasons and don't just throw him out there to the wolves right away but you're going to be talking about a guy who's in his late 20s when he gets a chance to play. Now, if you play from that point into your mid-30s and you score at a good QB level, then using a mid-second round pick on him is certainly fine, if not excellent. But again, the problem that we run into in these leagues is that that's a dead roster spot that you're going to have to keep through the cut down to 16 multiple times. 
So for me, I don't, I don't really understand that, but it does reinforce the idea. It, certainly, even if I'm wrong, it reinforces, I think, the idea that there's a tier break there. So you want to be aware of that as you're moving through your drafts. And then the next group is fascinating because we have guys like Blake Corum, Marshawn Lloyd, and Jalen Wright who are going in round two. The player whose fall I think is arguably a little bit more surprising is Xavier Leggett because he goes in the first round. And should you be putting a huge emphasis on that as opposed to the guys who went just after him? I mean, no, but those guys are definitely going earlier if they went to a good spot like Coleman and McConkie. And then even Pearsall, who has been drafted into a very difficult situation is going in a similar range. We also have players like Troy Franklin. It's always interesting when the fantasy community takes a stand and says, no, <laughs> the NFL teams are clearly wrong, right? Because, I mean, Franklin's ADP simply doesn't make sense. You can't have people pushing Bo Nix into the 202 and 203 and then come right back around and want to draft a day three receiver on a depth chart that already has Cortland Sutton and Marvin Mims. Now, a lot of that is a complete lack of confidence in Mims, but for Franklin to work, Nick's almost has to work. And then Franklin needs to do some other things as well. For me, this says, yeah, A, Troy Franklin should not have fallen in the draft the way that he did, but B, there's stealth enthusiasm for Bo Nix. Again, it's not represented in where he's going. And so that part is interesting. Am I making too much of that? Do I just want Bo Nix to be more than he is? What do you think about the fact that Troy Franklin is going in this spot as almost as though he were drafted in early round two? Yeah, I think though we do see some things like this, you know, each season, maybe not to this extent, but where, you know, the fantasy community have, an opinion of a player opposite to where the draft capital was. We see some players going, you know, in the and and people were right on this one, but Amari Rogers a couple of years ago for the Packers went in the second round and he was pretty much unwanted when it came to to rookie drafts. And you know, that turned out to be absolutely correct. But uh, you know, we do see that in certain situations. But we see it in basketball as well. When we look at, you know, where some of the star wide receivers have been drafted and then we see their quarterbacks and where they're going you know chris olave might f fall into that situation with a Derek Carr. sometimes the you know the path that people are taking to that success obviously through the the specific player but even with it troy franklin you know when you know we talked about a doonsie in the first show but the, even if he comes in and, and hits the ground running there's a lot of parts that maybe aren't you know a1 or a plus parts or you know the the parts that you want but there there are pathways being blocked in front of them and the waters are, are definitely a little bit muddier and then you get into a situation where it also is a bit like um with the bears a rookie quarterback but maybe you know i don't know maybe not as safe a path as, as what we have with williams there for that offense as well so there's a lot of muddy water in front of them to to get to you know the outcome that maybe people are expecting I don't really mind though when we look at you know which wide receivers then are are going specifically after him. I think that there's you know if we if we just look at positional base, it probably Jalen Polk would go ahead of him. But then we're into you know Maliki Carley, Roman Wilson by wide receivers being selected. So I could I could see there Marshawn Lloyd, Bra Braylon Adel Allen, who's going after him, certainly Ben Sinat, you know going ahead of him. Where in this particular draft I'm looking at where you and Blair. We're drafting and he goes at the the 210 you, you could see him going at the the 301 and i guess then i don't have as much of a a pushback on, on where he has been selected but you know that kind of 2 it to 211 range is, is where he's kind of consistently coming off the board but the second round to have a further look at it before we probably finish up by making our kind of decision as to where we're finally going to go with our selection these uh rookie drafts at the FFPC also include veterans. So you will see some of those names sprinkled into round two, but, you know, Blake Corum, you mentioned P Penix. He is going in that kind of mid to early, you know, round two in quite a few of these 205, 204 range. Then Franklin Lloyd, Jalen Wright, Mitchell, um, Sonat, who I mentioned, sometimes falling into round three, Pearsall in there as well, and then Leggett, 
you know, usually at the earlier side. But he, all of these guys, Sean, depending on the the league, there has been a kind of a wide range of where we're we're seeing some of those guys go, depending on the draft. Surprised by how much flux is in that tier, or do you think that kind of like what I was saying with the guys at the the back of round one into mid round two, and then when you get into mid round two to the end of round two, it's kind of like these guys, depending on the draft, could kind of go in any order. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense, though, when we're starting to talk about round two picks. The one, again, that I just keep coming back to is Franklin, and it's always interesting when you think that you're higher than the market on someone and you find out, like, maybe I'm not even at the market, which is a weird dynamic. Everybody that we brought on OT really liked Franklin, so it's not a huge surprise that people would also then like him post-draft. But I wanted to come out of these drafts where the stockpiled a lot of twos and a lot of early threes with almost 100% Franklin. And that's become very, very difficult because I do think it's problematic to select him ahead of Adonai Mitchell, who is kind of a checkered prospect, but has massive upside and was drafted much, much earlier. I think it's difficult to take him ahead of either Jalen Wright or Marshawn Lloyd, because those are the two explosive backs in this draft. And they're both in a situation where the 2024 landscape is favorable to well, to them right away, right? The right situation is pretty clear cut. The Dolphins uh, both are both of their offenses that, you know, one that finished the season extremely strong last year and the, the Packers obviously and one and the Dolphins who are one of the most explosive in the entire NFL. Yeah, and you read what's happening with the Packers there and, the, you know, these are just puff pieces for the most part, but they seem very in on Lloyd and playing him with Josh Jacobs. So you're going to, take a Troy Franklin ahead of those guys. So basically I'm ending up without, and then Ben Sennett. So the other thing is we get to the end of round two and it's this issue of you got Franklin against Lloyd against Wright against the tight end. And in both of my drafts, tight end premium in tight end premium with Blair and with Ben, that question of Lloyd versus the tight end was a very difficult one. And Franklin is, is already off the board at that time. So I think that that part is pretty interesting. Colin, let's kind of quickly go through this in the same format that we went with round one, where I'm going to start with the 112 because that's kind of the second round range, I would argue. Pat and I had the choice of Jonathan Brooks or Brian Thomas. We took Brooks, right or wrong? I, I think we, ugh, that's... Uh, I, I don't really like the Latin spot for... For Brooks, um, I probably would still, and I just think I'm biased towards the wide receiver. If I'm 50 50 on the two situations, uh, I think I would lean Thomas there. Not saying that the, you, I, 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 I feel bad now because uh, I can't really say that Pat and Sean are wrong, but no, <laughs> that's that's, like, yeah. that's the beauty of it. We had, we had you an option for McConkey there. Um, I don't believe so. He wasn't in the conversation though. Okay. Colm, I had the 112 in a league where my roster is loaded other than the second QB spot. Have Jalen Hurts, have running back stars, tight end stars, you know, decent receiver depth. I also had the 201, had 112 and 201. I took Knicks to start with, and then at the 201, I offered trades i ended up moving back from the 201 to the 203 is that the right way to play the 112 201 yeah we talked about next already but i like in situations where you are looking to add anything to do with obviously the quarterback position but i, I think when once you go beyond the worthy pick i think next for me is the the next player that i i want in this situation the one you moved back from then obviously and the 201 was the selection was for Lad McConkey, who I who I am interested in when it gets to that back end of the, the first round range. But you take Trey Benson, and I mentioned not liking the, the land spot all that much for for Brooks. And I thought I still think he can succeed, but like I mentioned with Franklin, there is a lot of parts again to overcome in that situation. Benson landing with the Cardinals, I think, is is very interesting. And you mentioned there with Lloyd. You have a pathway to success in 2024, but you know. James Conner had a really strong season last year, but I think we're obviously into the the latter stages of, of his 
production in the NFL. Uh, and I think Benson has a, a wide open pathway to being the, the running back one, you know, 2025 and beyond. So when I moved back, I picked up a third from moving back from the 201 to the 203. And I have that as a flat group with Benson, McConkey, and Coleman. The interesting thing is I do have Benson at the 201, McConkey 202, Coleman 203. So you would think that when I moved down and my guy lasted, I'd be ecstatic, but it was really the opposite because I feel like even though Benson is going earlier, the other two guys are the ones that individual drafters are willing to trade in for, which is something that you have to kind of be aware of. Like who are the guys where there are people out there who will pay you for them? Once I moved down to the 203, I could not move out of it. Made that offer to basically, you know, two thirds of the league. It's kind of a weird league where you can look at all the rosters and be like, yeah, I mean, I could see this team missing the playoffs, but then being good enough to win the 101. I could be trading for the 101. No one was willing to give me that pick, which is a little bit unusual because it's not that easy to trade into the 201 through the 203 if you want to, right? If you're looking at it coming from the other direction, I wasn't able to move. I had to take Benson. That's okay. But since I have Wright at 204 and Lloyd at 207, even though there's a tier break there for me, it's pretty close. It's pretty close. So that's the right move, moving down, taking Benson, if you get stuck with him there. Yeah, I think if you get stuck, that's the... If you get stuck, you have to make a pick, Sean. You don't have to make a pick, but you I like just... You, know, you could just tie him out and then... Wait you know, longer at the 201. Don't take the first offer that comes in. Yeah, and it is tricky because you want to, you know, in that situation, just talking about the league, you want to try and do your best with you know league etiquette as well like we did run down the clock in the first round and you know those times where i was like man all these other people are waiting to draft we could just you know we might get a trade done but i think you have to, to play it out you don't know also if any other offers are going to come in unless you're sending the offers to the other league mates so i think i think it was a fair move down and obviously you would like to continue to move down and that's what we're trying to achieve but there's also going to be times where trading down is just not possible or the the negotiations don't work out so ben and i had the 205 as we continue to move through round two we picked xavier leggett he is in this tier with franklin mitchell pearsall what's the right order for those guys Leggett and Mitchell are pretty close, and I would go Franklin and, and Pearsall beyond that. Um, I think Pearsall becomes very intriguing You know, if we get any moves from the 49ers to move on from one of their veterans, uh, and Debo or uh, also an Ayuk. But, you know, he's, he's at the moment, uh, he's extremely boxed in in terms of where the success is going to come from him in 2020. Uh, for and he could be somebody who when we look in 12 months you know will maintain his value but he might be somebody who with a slower rookie season is somebody to try and you know buy in on ahead of the 2025 season would you agree with that or for Pearsall there yeah yeah his is one where i think that you have to understand that his value is probably going to be dinged and yet he's not that expensive either and so from that perspective, you're fine, but he'll be looked at more like a buy low because yeah. he is blocked. Whereas some of these other guys, if they don't produce, then it's going to hurt them. Yeah. And so that part I do like for Pearsall. The overall upside and the profile I think is trickier. And so that's why he's somebody that I'm generally trading out of that spot, letting somebody else pick him. Blair and I had the 206, really 207, but Xavier White was picked in there as a veteran. Veterans are in play. Sometimes you will have a veteran who does have a round two value that someone has had to cut. We have that pick. We have also several other picks later in round two. So we go ahead and take Wright and then Franklin when he gets to us, Lloyd when he gets to us. Ben and I were in the situation where Lloyd got to us at the 210 and then we took senate at the 211 that's the rest of the way i see round two playing out any additional thoughts on those guys when you're looking at right lloyd and the tight end do you have any strong preferences there the, the one thing with senate that is interesting is that you know i i do think that he's going to slide into that early third round quite a bit and i was talking about you know if we were to move out of our pick and you know trying to potentially move back up into the second round but you know we have those picks in the mid till 
you know, if we do this trade, would also give us a 312. I think that he is probably the player that you're likely looking to move up for that would be a realistic trade target. Uh, I don't think he makes it to the mid mid third, but he is somebody I think in this particular format that's when you're talking about players who could you could see their value increase immediately and, and quite a lot in 2024. When we get to this point of the draft, I feel like after uh Lloyd in particular, who's generally going at the back end of the the second round, as we mentioned, I think that he is the one that that offers you know a, a quick kind of return on investment, but somebody who you can also continue to hold then beyond that. So Colin, that wraps up our look at round two. You've teased that we'll make this pick. My counter offer to you is that we should make a counter offer to the person offering us. And then will we stretch that out for another podcast in, in the future? Uh, how many podcasts can we get out of this this draft, Sean? As, as I joke, listeners are like, I, please, no more. <laughs> but the thing is, I think it's good because when we talk about the strategy and the perpetual reloading and the different scenarios, and, and but like when you're talking about where you have certain players ranked and making those decisions, I think this really helps people then make their own informed decisions when they are on the clock or when they're in trades in future trying to make those decisions so sean i think we're going to have to park it there and and unless we want to talk it out here when we're on because we're going to have to talk it out after we finish recording anyway so i when when you mentioned the counter offer the current offer as it stands is the 312 and the 2025 first round pick um and then that will be for our 202 so we the pick sean would be making is bonex so it's basically going to be for us bonex or the 312 and the 2025 first rounder what i would be potentially looking to do then would be test the water a bit and move up but it is going to be tricky with the the pieces that we have but checking on the draft there is the potential and i having the rosters pulled up you know i think there's a chance that we see next slide past the halfway point off that second round and and between him and you know some of the running backs i think we could potentially move up what would counter offer that you're you're proposing me i think it would just be for a little bit more that 312 is already a good offer monty and i after passing on the qb multiple times even though we didn't have one nicks did go at the 202 i believe in our draft and then we subsequently traded with that manager and we gave up our future first plus we had to also swap the 305 for the 402. So the straight out, get the 312, is obviously more value than Monty and I had to pay. Now, one of the things that the other manager might be betting on is that even though Monty and I are absolutely loaded everywhere else, if you don't have quarterbacks, you can miss the playoffs, and then you can win the backdraw. That manager could be betting that we actually have the 101 that we're trading for Bo Nix. So you want to keep that in mind. So we thought we were going to have a final decision on the the selection or the trade, but we are going to talk it through a little bit further and try and get those negotiations and rather bore people with the actual ins and outs of full negotiations and and you know how they go. We obviously have to wait for the other managers to get back to us. We will update people on, on what happens on a, a future road of his OT, but that is going to do it for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed listening through some of our thoughts on on round two and some of the strategy conversations we did do round one in a similar style on the monday edition make sure you check that out the best way to get all these shows once they're available is to go to the road of his overtime podcast feed and you can get them once they are available my name is colin kelly you can follow me on twitter at overtime Ireland. my co-host is sean siegel check out all of sean's work up on road and until we are back have a good one